Hey, thanks for checking out the Solid Verbal. Now would be a great time to subscribe to the channel for college football content all off season long. Hey everybody, and welcome to the Solid Verbal. You are hearing the dulcet tones of me and right now exclusively me because Ty is attending to something far more important than notarizing and creating an inventory of Ari Wasserman of The Athletic and his receipts. That's right. We are going to fashion receipts so we can clip any clip from this episode. And it sounds like I'm trying to antagonize Ari, who's going to join us momentarily, but that's not the case at all. Because sometimes Ari will speak and shoot from the hip with a take or something in the moment. And you know what? There are a lot of moments where those come to fruition. They are right. Ari is correct. They're not all correct, but I'm very excited for this episode. As always... Uh, subscribe to the show, follow the show if you haven't yet. Uh, check out the YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the at sign solid verbal. That's, that's the cool way to do things now. Uh, I don't know, follow on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, all of that stuff. And we've got big things coming, so make sure you subscribe and follow, I guess, wherever you can. I promise Ty will be back soon. Uh, everybody's better half Ty Hildenbrandt. Ari Wasserman, The Athletic. How are you this morning? Welcome back to the Solid Verbal Boys and Girls. Did I did I do good? You did well. You did. You were very good. He that, loves the boys and girls. It? Welcome. He always says boys and girls. I couldn't remember exactly how he starts it. Um, he does. But something how like are things that, yeah. going in uh, sunny Chicago land? Mm, not sunny today. Not great. It's overcast and damp. It's not. It's not. It's it's kind of stanky. It's okay. It's still summer. Everything's good. I made pizza Friday night. We'll get. Maybe we'll get into that at the end yeah, of the I episode. Saw. Here's what I want to do today. So I have. I don't know, two games for you. One of them's called Receipts, once again. And the other game, and this is a game we've played many times. Did you recognize this voice? Dunzo! Uh, yes, yes, but you're going to have to run me through the rules again. Okay, who is that voice? Oh, no, I've, I've heard it on this show before. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So that's Kristen Cavallari, of course, from Laguna Beach and then a bunch of other shows, reality-type shows. That's when her car broke down and she declared her car on Laguna Beach. This, we're talking to aspirational Southern California Ari Wasserman. Uh, yes. Dunzo. And so, Who hasn't watched that show, by the way. You Never did not watch it. Laguna Beach. But I thought about going back and watching it because oh. I like looking at the scenery. The older you but, get and the further away from your teenage years, the weirder it probably will be. The experience yeah, is probably but I just like looking weird. at pretty California houses and stuff. So okay, like, that's I, good. Like, that's like that's I'm, how I I'm tolerate glad you said houses that. instead of teenagers. That's yeah, a very I realized nice when step. I said the scenery, people are gonna be like, "This guy's an old creep that's talking about the the women on the show." No, no, no. Uh, no, that's not what I was getting at. I watched that realtor show on Netflix with my wife because I just mm. like love looking at the houses. Uh, I don't care about the drama. I just like zone in or zone out, and then I'll like lock back in when they're showing the houses. Okay. Um, because Laguna is my favorite place on the face of the earth. And one day when wow. I'm rich and famous, I'm going to live there. Um, but, you know, maybe one day I'll either be rich uh, or famous. But probably <laughs> You just have not. to meet so somebody we'll like that. That's all you I have just, to do. I just found out, and I sent this to you on Instagram before we started. I don't know if you saw it yet, but I already live in one of the most expensive cities in the entire country. Yeah, um, so you're great. You're around so all those like San people. Francisco. It says net worth to be financially comfortable. Can I do this real quick and then we'll sure, get into football? Sure, please. Hijacking your show? No, these are also uh, receipts. Number one, San Francisco, one point seven million. Yep, makes sense. Number two, Southern California, mm -hmm. one point five million. Number three, New York City, one point two million. Yep. Four, Seattle, one million. Mm -hmm. Five, DC, one million. Six, Boston, nine hundred and thirty-two thousand. Yeah. Seven Dallas, yeah, eight hundred and twenty thousand. Eight Chicago, eight seventeen. So we're like right next to each other here. So I feel like if you and I got all of our money, all of our ruples, and we, you know, hit the pawn shop and got rid of some of the excess stuff, we could all go in and have a multi-family home in <laughs> Laguna Beach together, which may or may not sound appealing to you. A but compound sounds great to me. Sure, the pod. If compound. you bring your pizza oven, like I feel like that would be bad news for for everybody. Well, that's how but, we can pay the mortgage, right? We're just yeah, right. Slanging well, pies, pods, and slanging pods and pods pies. and pies. It's not bad. It's not a bad business idea. All right. I don't know how we're going to get into this game specifically, but I have a list of topics. You've seen them briefly. Um, so the thing that inspired me to do this game, Ari's Receipts, is that you have been consistently on the record saying 
Texas is going to make the playoff. You've put your money where your mouth is. Um, Texas is going to make the playoff in the next this season or the next two seasons. Um, listen, first before we get into these, okay. these predictions, we're entertainers, right? Of course. And people listening might disagree, but that's how we, I think, would yeah. describe ourselves. I mean, I'm a journalist yeah. and a podcaster, and mm-hmm. every year that goes by, I'm becoming more of a podcaster and less of a journalist. Mm-hmm. That's just kind of the way that my career is headed. Um, and that doesn't mean that I don't want to be factually accurate. I think what makes the podcasts that I've been a part of um, in your podcast that you do uh, good is that you're informed and well-researched, and you don't try to stray from the reality of it. Right. But at the same time, too... We don't cover the Pentagon. So no. in that realm, if I think Texas is going to make the playoff, why should I be afraid to say it? I agree. Like everybody is so like, I feel like sports people take themselves too seriously. I agree. And I don't know what the harm is of saying, you know what? I'm looking at Texas. I look at them every year and they stink after I say this, but I'm looking at them this year and there's certain elements to it, which we'll get into that I think are different. Right. Um, you that just have to show your work. I think that's the difference in yeah. sports media between likable, enjoyable people is show your work. Say what Texas has done recruiting and developing and Pete Kwiatkowski's history, mounting and developing a, a quality defense and Steve Sarkeesian building offense. And last year they flashed X, Y, and Z and their schedule this year features A, B, and C. If you show your work, one of my problems is when somebody – makes like here's my playoff prediction here are my here's my top four in august and there's like two three and i'm not i i happen to like desmond howard um but there were like he included Pitt last year and baylor maybe i forget like yeah and i don't know if i ever saw him show his work um and that was the problem to me so if you believe in texas and you show your work in an interesting way i'm yeah. fine with it and but, then if i'm wrong i was wrong yeah like you, like, you know, it. it's like there's some people who do like have a hard time being wrong. Like, I think mm-hmm. I do a pretty good job of firing people up, but I also do a pretty good job of acknowledging when I was off the off the mark. I agree. So we can get into it. And that's why I'm like saying, like, you, you can keep your receipts if you want. Um, and I want you to push that button a lot. But at the same time, too, if I am wrong, uh, you know, in six months from now, uh, that won't be any different than being wrong in the past. But I also feel like in the off season, people might find it interesting and entertaining to understand that hey maybe texas is actually going to be good this year okay so in my thought process on that okay outline for me the reason you believe obviously the thing that held texas back last year was not being able to sustain success during games right they jump out to a lead and then string together seven straight catastrophically bad drives in the second half Mm -hmm. right they weren't adjusting or weren't executing with any sort of consistency especially on offense as the defense improved last year that was the big thing that a couple of years ago, Texas's defense was kind of a mess, uh, showing flashes. And last year, it actually came together quite nicely. I think probably quietly because they were still losing dumb games and you know fading away on offense. So, what is it about the construction and path that Texas has this year that has you feeling especially confident? They have good lines. Yep. That's it. I don't think they've had. I think that no, that's not it. I don't want to. I just don't want to start with the hits. <laughs> no, which I know, is, I know. They're more talented than everybody else, and you know their schedule is actually pretty hard. Um, yeah. You know, with the with the game on the road at Alabama, and I think week two. Mm-hmm. Um, but I actually believe that they have very good, uh, you know, top tier offensive line talent. If you've been paying attention to what yeah. they've recruited, they've brought one of the best offensive linemen in the country, who's a sophomore this year, um, and their defensive line is sneaky deep. Um, and they have coordinator that, mm-hmm. that has a proven track record of building a defense and say what you want about Sark and his inability to win big at other stops. Uh, he knows how to design offense. So sure. if you look at everything that is, um, you know, in play here, you know, you have a week two game at Alabama, which by the way, I'll also receipt button mm-hmm. say that they have a chance to win right now. Sure. Absolutely. If they have really good line play. Um, you know, they've their their offensive skill is probably the best in the country, or at least top five. And then you're playing in a conference for the most part that um doesn't have the talent to stack up. 
but somehow they always have three point spreads in that conference. And the thing that has always been the case with with Texas is that you know you can outline all the reasons why you think they're going to be good at their best. Right. My question is whether or not they're going to lose to Kansas State this year. Right. Of course. Or Iowa State or what? And like that to me is the unpredictable part because it's like. You look at the schedule and I say, well, they have a game against Oklahoma and they have a game against Alabama. They will be favored and should win every other game on their schedule. So if they drop one out of the two games that are in question in the preseason, then they should be a one loss conference champ at the end of the year. And if they are, that's a playoff team. That's my right. that's my calculus there. But what I can't account for, and I'm not going to pretend like I can, is whether or not they're going to lose to Baylor on September 23rd when they go to Waco. Like that to me has always been the hallmark of the underachieving Texas that needs to be accounted for. And the thing that's been most frustrating to me about Texas, Dan, Mm -hmm. and maybe you can help me out with this is on paper, the talent that they've had, you know, has always been very good. But what is it about Texas through multiple coaching regimes and multiple decades that has set the program up independent of who's playing quarterback and who's coaching to continually falter in games against teams that are not nearly as equipped to to compete and don't have the money to throw at every problem that they have? Um, And if you can identify what that is, which nobody can, and the only, you know, thing that you can think of is uh, coaching turnover, um, then... What? How can I accurately predict whether or not they're going to not stub their toe three times this year and finish eight and four uh, with three inexplicable losses while also looking awesome in big games? Like it's a difficult thing to try to unpack. So all I can do is take with what we know concrete, which is they've got good lines. Mm-hmm. They've got a quarterback that we are expecting to take a major step forward. I also think that Quinn Ewers got more flack last year than he deserved. I thought he looked pretty good. You know, for being he a first-time a, starter. A, a big I, 12 stretch that – and it's – look, he's coming off of the injury that he suffered against Alabama, so he wasn't 100% yeah. for much of the year. But he was not a downfield thrower last year. It was a lot of shorter stuff, and it mm-hmm. was – he got weaker over the courses of, of games. And, that look, it, it could 100% be the injury thing, but the offense just did not explode in the way that we, I think, expected. Xavier Worthy, it came out, he was injured, yeah. and so they were – they were playing a bunch of beat up guys, and I get—I don't know if that's because they the backups were not trustworthy. Whatever the reason, um, they were not built to win winnable games last year. So the obvious pull the cord, parachute, escape, whatever you want to call it, is, right. is if Quinn doesn't take a step forward and he's just an average quarterback, right? Then that that puts uh, you know a little bit of uh, you know damper on the thought process because I do think that there is a reality where Quinn Ewers is the third quarterback off the board in april is that a crazy thing to say he's eligible this year because of how yes, long he's been the out ohio state yep the ohio state year um no obviously you know he has a big arm and he's athletic and built like a a, a prototype nfl person, quarterback the elite 11s like, yeah I mean, the guy's got a laser arm so people are like oh he can't throw it's like have you ever watched like why he was rated what he was and i'm not saying he's going to be good because he was rated highly but like right. i thought you know, coming out in your first, was it his first start ever mm-hmm. against Alabama last year? And if you weren't, get, that had him on the ropes or like, like that's, I think it was his first start a, against a power five team. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's got to count for something. Right. So like my thought is if Sark could convince Arch Manning to go there because he is some sort of quarterback guru, right. Um, that he should have the depth, um, or the, the the tools to make him a much better quarterback this year, even if it's not as hyperbolic, as you like to say, right. as being the third best player at his position in college football. A huge jump into the top 10 mm-hmm. makes Texas a very den- dangerous football team. Also, too, Malik Murphy is going to be a stud. I don't know if he's going to be a stud at Texas. Right, right, right. Yeah, he'll be a great... <laughs> he's going to be a short story I was at the elite 11 regional in Austin a few months ago and Malik mm-hmm. Murphy walked by me in the stands mm-hmm. and like I almost fell over in shock about like how because I, I covered him two years ago at the finals in LA mm-hmm. and the amount of physical growth that he's had uh, he looks like the exact type of player that will go to the combine and be drafted number one overall one day because they fall in love with him the way that they did with Anthony from Richardson the and, University you know. of Arizona well, Malik yeah, it is, yeah it's like to me it's like I don't know what went on, you know, at Alabama. It's like, I thought he could be the starter somewhere in the Power Five. Sure, right absolutely. Now. Um, so if things don't go, or if Quinn gets hurt because he got hurt last year or mm-hmm. something goes wrong, 
I'm not even going to say Arch Manning's name. I think Malik Murphy would come in and be really good. So, and he looked great in the spring game. So I think all the little pieces that you have with Texas, Mm -hmm. doesn't that have to outweigh, well, they always lose to Texas Tech? Or do you have to just go, well, they lose to Texas Tech every year, so like it's just going to happen again? Like, what do you think is carries more weight in your mind? I mean, there has to be a reason why everybody keeps losing in the same manner. And maybe they all have unique reasons within a broader narrative or something. I don't know if it's a Sark is an offensive coordinator and recruiter in there as a head coach. And when he can fully focus on running an offense, he's great. But now when he has everything else to run and is calling an offense... It perhaps he's not as good a communicator, whatever. But it has to translate back all the way to the Charlie Strong era, right? Like you have to well, keep going back. Well, and Mac Brown too. Well, you can you Mac can Br- you can look at the end of Mac Brown as like his recruiting strategy was clearly flawed and taking basically yeah only early early juniors at Junior Day. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. Also, too, he won a national title, so I guess you you have to. He's like the last coach. He's the that exception. Broke. Yeah. Well, um, early two so, thousand. But like, yeah, it's been. Almost 20 years since that happened, believe it or not. We are old. Yeah. But, uh, but, yeah, so, like, if you think that the thing that causes them to recur that or for that loss to be a recurring theme for them still exists, which is, I think, a fair hypothesis given that it happens every year. Mm-hmm. But, like, I just want to be right one year looking at the ingredients. You know, you're the pizza guy. Mm-hmm. They've got the ingredients of a great pizza, right? They've got a great sure. crust. They've got a great sauce. They've got a great cheese. And they've got some nice toppings. Right. Can they put together a really good pizza is the question. And it's like, how do I, from my living room in Dallas, decide whether or not they're actually going to be able to do it this year? How do I know if Sark is going to right to put the oven on? A You're little looking bit at too, a faulty oven hot. with terrific ingredients and a terrific chef. Yeah. yeah. But all I'm looking at is the ingredients. So I, I'm to me, I'm, I'm always an in- ingredients person. Yeah. And then like what you said before, I don't know if we were live or not yet, but predictions are not my job. I don't know when right. it became my job, mm-hmm. but I'm supposed to break down, analyze, and write about things that happened. I'm not supposed to tell the future. So in the podcast realm where we are entertaining, we do it, but I don't think I'm good or bad at my job based on whether or not I could calculate that. Because if I could, I would be in Suge Knight's house in Las Vegas on a on a raft <laughs> Just making gambling picks over unders all year and just like laying around. I would never put a shirt on. Of course not. My life isn't, but I'm. <laughs> okay. I don't want to talk about Texas, though I do want to talk about you at Shook Knight's house. Um, <laughs> the Death Row Records pool house, you know, with the pool yeah, that was course. red? Of course. Um, yeah. I want to go to the Midwest, my current home. Um, which of these teams, so Michigan's gone to the playoff the last two years, Ohio State went to the playoff of course last year um and penn state has never been to the playoff there is a good amount of penn state hype because of the high level nfl caliber talent that's back this year and decided to come back this this season drew aller five-star quarterback Mm -hmm. is presumably taking the reins at quarterback and probably the highest level quarterback penn state has had since early christian hackenberg in terms of physical tools and arm talent and all those fun terms uh Offensive line finally gelled last year. They've got a great backfield of running backs, incredible defensive talent. Ohio State is as talented basically as anybody less than Bama at this point. I forget what the, the exact uh, talent rankings are at the moment. but One uh, Georgia, two Alabama, three Ohio State. Oh, sorry, one Alabama, two Ohio State, three Georgia. And there's right. a drop-off between Georgia and Ohio State. Yes. Uh, Ohio State loaded at a number of positions, but has had some defensive questions, some in-game play calling questions these past couple seasons with Ryan Day and losing to Michigan. Um, and then Michigan is the team that their identity, despite you know replacing a couple coordinators there or full-time coordinators, their identity is sort of set in stone. They've got a winning quarterback uh, and a schedule that behooves <laughs> all people that root for Michigan. And the path is kind of incredible. So which of those three teams, or how would you rank those three teams, or how do you view those three teams? And Ohio State has all that talent, but they don't necessarily have a proven quarterback, which seems important. Um, how do you rank them? Oh, God. That's, a hard, that's a hard question. Yeah. I mean, it really is. So I just say, can I put Penn State three and just like remove them from the top two? You can do whatever you want. Not, I asked you and, the and question. <laughs> That's not to say that Penn State doesn't have a chance of being very good. Right. Um, they have some really good defensive line talent. And, you know, me, I'm a five-star quarterback stand. Mm-hmm. So, you know, like they have 
somebody who might be very good. And like, I think that Penn state, if they made the playoff this year would be the least shocking time for them to make it than any time in the playoff. Era. Right. Even probably less shocking than in 16. So that's more of a compliment to what Ohio state and Michigan are than it is a negative viewpoint of Penn state. Mm-hmm. That said, now we're back to the two and I have a hard time because I look at the ingredients, right? Okay. And I look at the Ohio State ingredients and like my brain is programmed to say, oh, they're the second most talented team in the entire country. The team that played Georgia snap for snap in the playoff last year is who Ohio State is. With um, CJ Stroud. Ryan Day has yes. an infallible. Yes. Yeah, but he has also an infallible track record of developing quarterback talent. True. So I don't know if it's wise to nag Ohio State because you don't know who their quarterback is when it's probably a pretty safe bet that whoever it is is going to be very good. That's um, totally fair. So that, to me, is a very compelling case for Ohio State to not only be the most likely um, team to make the playoff out of the Big Ten, but also a team that I would probably feel safely uh, or pretty certain or safe parking my money with for mm-hmm. a national title bet. Um and I think that they're closer to Georgia and Alabama than Michigan is. That said, I think Ohio State has a Michigan problem right now. And okay. even though I think Ohio State is a team that is more likely to win a national championship this year, I think Michigan is the more likely team to win the Big Ten. Sure. Can I do that? Yeah. Does that that's... make sense to you? Yeah. So, like, to me, the way that the season start, the, the season played out last year, if you watch the playoff, everybody with eyes knows that Ohio State was more equipped to be on that stage than Michigan was. Sure. And we'll never get to see how Michigan would have played against Georgia because they lost in the first round of TCU. Mm-hmm. But if you watch the Georgia-Ohio State game, you were watching two titans of the sport. Sure. Right? And that titan lost to Michigan at home by a billion, like a month earlier. So which are we going to get? The Ohio State that craps its pants against Michigan now? Or are we going to get the Ohio State team that plays like they did against Georgia and typically plays in the playoff, say for a few appearances, Mm -hmm. or we can, you know, and like, how do I decide that? So for me, the safe and probably prudent thing to do would be to put Michigan number one in the big 10, because they deserve the benefit of the doubt. They have a bunch of returning talent. I think they probably are going to be better than they were last year. Mm -hmm. Um, they have a formula that beats Ohio State twice. It has proven to not be a fluke. Yeah. And they have a proven quarterback who might be the third pick at the position in this draft. Second time I said it on the podcast. Sure. Both are true. Yeah. Then Ohio State number two, because if they turn it on and they win that game on the road, which also is into the formula that the game is on the road this year. Mm-hmm. Um they could win a national championship, and then Penn State would have to do something remarkable, which is get through both of them. That's just a harder path and for a team that has never proven to be able to beat one of them, really, uh, to do it both of them. Right. Or at least win the Big Ten with one loss to them is a really tough route. So I think that that is just a hard thing for them to do. But I think Penn State's going to be a very good football team this year. So that's my viewpoint of it. But if I had to guess who's going to win a national championship – Ohio State is the only of those three, in my opinion, that can win two playoff games. So what's the knob that needs to be turned for Ohio State from the last couple of years, right? Is it mm-hmm. filling lanes along the defensive line and being more mindful about rotating in fresh legs on defense against a team like Michigan? Is it rethinking the construction of the team and recruiting, right? Sometimes mm-hmm. great recruits aren't the correct recruits, right, to, yep. to win games like the Michigan game. Is Ohio State better built – to win in a dome than they are to win outside, which is a weird way of thinking about this. But you saw, you know, when the elements got a little bit tricky for Ohio State, that was what what Michigan relished, essentially, right? To just get down and dirty. Um, yeah. And Ohio State wasn't willing to successful or wasn't able to successfully play that game. So what is it knob-wise that yeah. needs to be turned? I was on the phone with Urban Meyer uh for a story I'm working on a few days ago Mm -hmm. and I regretted not asking him. And I don't know if he would have been honest with me because he's, you know, close with Ryan. Right. What do you think is off right now? Mm -hmm. Because I think that that knob that you're asking me to answer Mm -hmm. is one of the most interesting stories in college football right now. Sure. Because it's like, why does Ohio state falter in that game? Is it John Cooper happening again where they're making it too big 
and they are, you know, just kind of, you know, nerves wise, just not playing their best football because they're up in their feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, is Michigan tougher than them? Is that what it is? Ohio State can't stop the run against Michigan. Um, but that makes me second guess myself because they did a pretty good job of hanging in there with Georgia, who I think is Michigan on uh, five or six steps down the line. Sure. Right. Like, isn't Georgia just better, a better version of Michigan? Yeah. Like, or it's Michigan with better players. Yeah. It's Michigan with a much deeper defense with more speed on offense, it seems. And there's speed on Michigan's yeah. offense. But and it's a team that the last couple of years has been more willing to get a little bit more creative on offense and has had the ability to take advantage of who they've had on offense which i think is if there's a complaint among michigan fans it's you know this this vision is great for the offense and it wins a ton but we're going to lose fast receivers and interesting all-purpose type players if we don't figure out ways to use them more appropriately and i think georgia does a good job of that yeah so but it's like weird to me because it's like how do you say ohio state didn't win the game on their home field last mm-hmm. year because they're not tough enough and then watch them go nine round boxing match with the best team in college football right and basically be one made field goal away from a national championship last year mm-hmm. when the team when the season was a failure you know right. like that is like a hard thing to kind of compartmentalize so can i just be a man and be like i don't know like i really don't know what has to happen i would think that there is this theory out there that says or that people think that ohio state went to national as a recruiting brand and like has lost the backbone of what it was, which is an Ohio Midwestern program that sure. has players that are built on the roster who grew up understanding and, you know, reveling in that rivalry. Mm-hmm. And if you have a bunch of kids from California and Texas and Florida, they don't quite understand the magnitude of it. Right. Um, but they were a nationally recruiting program uh, under Urban Meyer, and that never seemed to be the problem. So, right. you know, I think that the, the coach, um, Ryan Day, Um, is a very nice man, and I think that like if you sat down and had dinner with him, you would feel like you're just talking to a regular person, which I think is one of his more admirable traits. Mm -hmm. But I know for a fact that he's a highly (laughs) competitive human being behind the scenes, and I think he really, really, really wanted to beat Michigan last year because of you know, you know what happened the year before, and I and I he would never admit this to me, but I know for a fact that the born on third base comments really got to him. Sure, Um, and I think it's possible that. You know, there is such thing as overwinding yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that happened. Um, but all I know for sure, Dan, is whatever it is, every year that Michigan wins that game, the the the, the tumor grows and grows and grows and grows sure. until it gets out of hand. And I think that, like, it's pretty big right now. And if they don't win it this year, then, like, you have some major, major problems in Columbus. Um, what if Michigan is just really good? They are really good. What if that? But that's the thing, right? What if they are coached by a Super Bowl coached quarter? You know, a quarter. Uh, excuse me, a head coach who's been to the Super Bowl, who is a little bit more clear about uh, his in-game vision for his program, and also hired a better defensive coordinator and coordinators mm-hmm. to take down Ohio State specifically. And Ohio State, while they hired a really good defensive coordinator, maybe he is not able to get and the, the most out of his players in the way that yeah. Michigan is able to get the most out of their players. And Ryan Day simply doesn't have the vision that Jim Harbaugh does. I think that's possible. Um, and I think that there's no question. You'd be a liar if you didn't say that Jim Harbaugh, when when squeezing or wringing the rag, is getting mm-hmm. more water out of it than sure. Ohio State is with their roster. But I look at the blue chip ratio last year, and I look at it this year, and I say 85% of Ohio State's players are blue chip players, and 54% of Michigan's players sure. are. That's, that's a pretty big gap. But also, the quality of the blue chip player that Ohio State is getting is much higher than Michigan from an average player ranking perspective. They're getting top 100 players, and Michigan's getting top 350 players. Mm-hmm. That's not a one-for-one comparison. That's a gap. Right. So the talent gap between those two schools is so wide And so drastic. I don't think people appreciate how wide it is. And yet Michigan is continuing to win. So, like, do you think that coaching and knowing who you are and being a Super Bowl guy and all the things that you just mentioned outweighs the – it's like the little giants versus the the Cowboys That's not true. Michigan? It was four years ago. It was three years ago. And the gap is closing. The gap is closing. 
but there's still a drastic ocean wide gap in talent between the two schools. So like if it's just mm. mission, mi- you don't think so? No, I don't think it's ocean wide. I think if, if you're above that 50% mark and you have the fundamental pieces to win on a big level, which Michigan does, especially up front on defense that they're producing NFL talent and they're getting a lot out of all three levels of that defense, especially the young guys that came in last year. Um, I think there's also something, and you referred to this uh, It's just with simple Texas. math, though, Dan. No, I it's know it's the math, math thing, but yeah. you mentioned this with Texas, that sometimes there's something about a place, right? That maybe yeah. Michigan is a better place to develop excellent Big Ten players than Ohio State is. Maybe they okay, figured let- out a way to teach and communicate uh, winning Big Ten games more than Ohio State has. That when you right. are... Are a recruiting? I don't know if it's a recruiting nationally thing. I don't know whatever it is that Ohio State is also. I mean, Michigan's Being a huge of who national you are. brand, right? And so there is something about whether it's teaching, whether it's communication, that Michigan and I don't think there's a gulf. I, again, once you're over a certain level, like yes, you can but say. But I disagree with that. I disagree with that completely. Because if it, if there wasn't that big of a gap, then there would be more parity when it came to the highest level. Like, and when I said earlier, I think Ohio State is more likely in the better pick to win a national championship than Michigan is. Do you agree with that? Based on last year? Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that comes back to our terms too of winter wonders, right? That the team that generally has the special offensive skill talent combined with defensive line. So then you go look at Clemson receivers, you look at what Ohio state's receivers were last year, even beat up that that's the type of team that can beat Georgia, right? Or let um, me rephrase the question then. Do please. you think that Michigan could, play a game with Georgia that close or like do you think that they could make it look like that no where you have because Marvin Harrison flying all over the place and you know the ball flying from CJ Stroud and you know hard hits and speed and athleticism all over the field sure like I just don't think that Michigan on its best day could play a game like that I don't think Michigan and Ohio has... State can so that's the gap I'm trying to trying to say exists I think I think so, the gap last year between those two teams Ohio State and Michigan was more pronounced at quarterback like, I thought J.J. McCarthy very much looked like a freshman and C.J. Stroud very much looked like a top-five NFL draft pick. I think that's the difference when you parse those teams against a team like Georgia. And then when they played on the same field, mm-hmm. they got their butts kicked. So even if you and I are on different... Uh, but was that? You know, but that wasn't a quarterback thing as much. C.J. Stroud oh, right. made no, plays no, in that agree. game. Yeah. And J.J. McCarthy made plays in that game, especially like two or three deep balls. But I don't think J.J. McCarthy won that game with his arm. No, like he no, didn't take he didn't. it on his back. No, not even, so it's what it's right. what is asked of them. I think is the difference. So if that's the case, mm-hmm. then you'd be a fool to think that Ohio State would win this year. Sure. But so that's why I think that I like because like I conceded that point. Like mm-hmm. I said, I think Michigan should be the favorite to win. I think it, if you don't think Michigan is the favorite to win with the game at home with all these circumstances that we have then I don't know what what you're looking at. That said, I still think that the difference between the two rosters in the math, if you look at it this year, right. we're talking about a 30-player difference on an 85-man roster of blue-chip talent, and that doesn't even start to compare or to take into account the rankings of those four-star because a top 100 player and a four-star who ranks 367 is a huge difference too, and it's a one for one swap. So if you look at that, sure, I, I it's, the math on it is so lopsided that there's no way I could ever join you on that journey of, well, they're at they're past fifty percent, so it's not that big of it. It is a huge deal. Well, Ohio- and that's why I think that Michigan cannot win the national championship this year. So then turn your attention on why is Ohio State the place that continuously gets upset by much less talented teams. It's been that way for 20 years. I right. think Ohio State. So it's is Purdue. It's the most, Iowa. It's yeah. They got absolutely trashed up front by an Oregon team missing its yeah. star edge rusher and starting. And I believe this is true. Anthony Brown at quarterback, and they got stomped up front by Joe Moorhead's offense. You so, want to get your finger ready? Ready for the receipt button? I'm um, okay. Ohio State is the most underachieving program. <laughs> this is your. This is your book. College. Football, when compared to the resources and the talent they have on their roster, no one's done less. And two years ago, it might have been Georgia, but now it's not anymore. Obviously, no. I mean, this you've been you've been beating the drum for quite some time. I know ten years, and that's a receipt that you can frame and put on your wall because I keep saying it every year, and it just keeps coming true. 
So, like, if you go look at, like, the teams that Ohio State um, won the national championship with, like, an 0-2, mm-hmm. like, that was a special team that won by the skin of its teeth every week. Mm-hmm. And I don't think you'll ever be able to match that. Right. But, like, was 14 a better football team than 15? Like, all well, the teams that they've had, was 06 better than 05? Neither of them won. Right. Was was um, 03 better than 02 that didn't win? I don't know. Probably not, but maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, 19 might have been the best team they've ever had. They didn't win. They lost right. to Clemson mm-hmm. with that targeting penalty and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. And if you look at last year's missed field goal, like, maybe that's not a team that deserves to be in the, But they... they if they would have won the national championship, it would have been the most appropriate thing in the world because the only time they win one was with teams that shouldn't do it. The 14 team that won the national championship was a year early. There's no way they, you know that team would have you know, been considered or picked to win a national championship going into that year. So if you look at all the great teams at Ohio State, and you don't even get me started on the 90s, when you look at like the really, really good teams, mm-hmm. they had a, a talent advantage over Michigan. Uh, before the talent composite was even compiled. Mm-hmm. If you go look at the way those... And they lost to Michigan every year in the 90s, which is why people bring up John Cooper uh, when they talk about Ryan Day, which may or may not be fair. But there is something more to it than just composite rankings. And sometimes that's really, really hard to identify. And I think that's true with Ohio State. I think it's true with Texas. I think it's even true with a and Like, how can A&M have you know, all these great players and stink? And not just like be kind of bad or lose games they shouldn't, but like also just stink, you know? It's there, the, there's just something extra in the soup there. I think it's the crushing weight of the place. And each place has a different crushing weight of pressure or expectations, which is right the genius of Nick Saban, that he's able to get everything aligned, that he's able to withstand mm-hmm. that pressure and come out of it ahead every year, it seems. So that's that's the difference, that it, it takes – everybody needs a Nick Saban, and there's only one. And maybe yeah. a Kirby Smart. We'll see. And, like, I would love to know, and I don't even know if Nick Saban can quantify it, but, like, you know how Andy Staples, uh, God rest his soul, I miss you, buddy. Never uh, heard of him. Okay. Uh, has what's called the truth serum where you put, uh, you know, a, a shot in someone's neck mm-hmm. and they are for, there, it was in the Ben Stiller movie, you know, uh, Meet the Parents. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that was two. Mm-hmm. And they have to tell the truth for the next 10 minutes or whatever. If you ask Nick Saban, what is the ingredient in your secret sauce that not only allows you to recruit the way that you do, but get the most out of your teams year in and year out, even when the edge should be gone. Mm -hmm. What is it that you're doing? Because if you go look at the Ohio State program, you could find and circle maybe six or five teams out of the last 12 to 15 years that were good enough from a talent standpoint to win the national championship that didn't. What do you do in Tuscaloosa that is different than what Ohio State does in Columbus? Because they're very similarly situated from a talent standpoint. Right. And maybe more so even in Georgia, too. And that's changing because I think that we might be on the verge of all the Nick Saban things that never could be broken, all the records being, like, matched by Kirby in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. Like, that is out there. Like, and I don't know if people have recognized that or not, but the way that they're recruiting now and the way that they're built and the the juggernaut is kind of, like, on autopilot. Right. They could win six national championships in the next 12 years and be in the exact same place that Alabama is right now. Uh, but what's the difference? What is it that you are doing? What is it that Kirby knows? And that, to me, is the most valuable thing that you could buy or harness as a coach. My educated, and I don't know the answer to that. My educated guess is attention to detail, right? The very specific attention to detail that Nick Saban has, that he's he's not satisfied at national championships because that's time he could be recruiting. Um, that the attention to detail, and he probably runs a better practice than anybody else. Uh, if I had to guess, you know, when you listen to interviews that like practice is so much harder than games are that, you know, you practice something so often you just can't get it wrong. That's mm-hmm. the difference. If the problem with Ohio State against Michigan was execution, that's never going to be the problem. You might, Maybe there will be a scheme. Maybe there will be a specific lightning in a bottle team that beats Alabama like the Ole Miss teams. But I think it is the Nick Saban attention to te- detail, the ability to teach his assistants exactly what he expects with every minute detail, how this is taught, how that is taught, I think that's the difference. That the the confidence in his own uh, vision that Nick Saban has, I think, is a step beyond. Especially considering the fact that it's remained present Correct. despite the fact that they've had more roster, I mean, coaching turnover than anyone else. Um, because that's how you know it's the guy. All right. I'm going to do another receipt. 
Tennessee will win a playoff game in the next three years. I don't think so. Not merely get to win a playoff game. I don't think so. So uh, you are you are betting not, against Joe Milton and Nico's arms on that level. Yes, because I just don't know. If they played in a different conference, maybe. Okay. Because I think they'd have more shots at making the playoff in that span, which sure. then gives you a higher likelihood yep. of winning one. Um, I think that they are uh, way behind where they would need to be in the talent composite for them to do so. Okay. Like, they're not even in the blue chip ratio in this coming year, um, which means that they probably have to have four or five more years of really, really good recruiting before they can even come close to being mentioned in the same discussion as the Georgia, uh, you know, Alabama's. Well, remember, we're going to 12, so a potential playoff game could be against Wisconsin. Uh, It could be against, you know, Oregon. It could be against, you know, a number of teams. Penn State. Yeah, well, I guess then maybe I should change my answer. I'm thinking of, like, the four team. Um, And I guess I probably should have just thought about the 12 out of the gate. But, you know, I guess from that standpoint... Um, you know, I still think it might be no, Dan. Uh, I'm waiting for the defense. It's it's quarterback and defense. They've filled quarterback. It's defense. I think when they played Georgia last year, you got a front row seat of like just what the gap is there. And I don't know, you know, they would have made the 12 team playoff last year. And if Hendon Hooker didn't get hurt, Mm -hmm. um, they probably would have won a playoff game last year. So that's really, really hard. Again, the projection thing is tough. Um, But I just think that they probably are, four years away of really good things coming and happening to them before being awesome. The next big, big 12 rivalry game, which is to say we're losing Texas, Oklahoma as a big 12 rivalry game. The next big, big 12 rivalry game, which means that we have to have both bad blood and a collision course element. Both one team is six and one, the other seven and oh, and it always seems to be this way is between which two teams? Oh, I think TCU would have to be in there, right? Like, I think TCU-Baylor probably. The rivalry? Yeah. Um, Just two Texas teams, um, both of whom are consistently, you know, competing or have competed at the highest level and, um, you know, are not that far from each other. Do you? Th- how long do sense. you think if both TCU and Baylor are consistently good, 10-ish win programs... How long would it take for somebody in Seattle, Charleston, Portland, Maine, Ypsilanti, Michigan to Do people circle- in Portland, Maine watch any game? There's so- there's a guy named Scott <laughs> in Portland, Maine. Um, how long will it take TCU and Baylor at, to, to become a rivalry? Because it seemed like we were getting there. And then things went awry for both programs um, in if very they, different if they ways. played... I think it only takes three years. Three years? I think three consecutive years of must-watch games. Okay. So, like, if they if they are both 6-0 and o or 7-0 and o, mm-hmm. um, going into the game um, for three years in a row, you would get there. Okay. Because you have to uh, – because I think the whole thing with a rivalry is identifying who's standing in your way to being excellent. Yep. And then coming into them – um, or running into them multiple times in a three-year period. Like, I remember when I was on the Ohio State beat that Clemson was in their way a bunch, both in recruiting and in um, the playoff. And it took three years before Ohio State outlined them as a rival. You live um, You live in Dallas. I do. Okay, there's a receipt right there. I can confirm. Boom. I have the receipt. Um, I assume you have met people that went to TCU. Very few. They're all Aggies and Longhorn it's fans. It's a tiny actually. school. Yeah. And so I I think the one guy I know is Marshall Newhouse, who played at TCU, that I've come yeah. across. There's a guy down the street who has a TCU flag from where I am right now. But the problem is, with those huge rivalries nationally, or big rivalries, or interesting rivalries, generally like you've come across somebody who went to that school, an aunt's you know, ex-husband or something. Oh, yeah, he went to Alabama. Yeah. Um, the problem with where the Big 12 is right now is the lack of national programs. And TCU specifically is has such a small footprint in terms of people familiar with that school. So That's how important tough do you think me. that is, though? Do you think what, – because like, like you're asking me how do we get Scott from Portland, Maine to watch? Yeah, I have no – I don't even have an idea of what my answer would be. So I don't know if enrollment matters. I think what people want is a good product. 
Sure. So if they manage to continually be very good, and that conference is still um, in the midst of producing teams that we believe can advance in the playoff, mm -hmm. then it becomes must-watch TV for anybody who claims to be a college football fan. That's and like, true. Listen, like if you're a college football fan, you're I'm watching games all day that I wouldn't otherwise care about, but just mm -hmm. because I want to see how it goes. But I don't think the, the average college football fan watches 12 hours of football on Saturdays. Yeah. But I think that if it was six and over six and zero, oh, um, and it's the last big speed bump on a team's, especially in the twelve team playoff uh -huh. era, then you 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 watch that. Um, that said, I have some concerns about whether or not the Big Twelve is going to be Group of Five e when the Group of Five ceases to exist. Right, like that's the thing that's tough, and it's we're talking about a team that's still in that conference that that played for a national championship last year. Mm -hmm. So, but what happens when the changes occur and the USC and UCLA are in the big 10 and Texas and Oklahoma are in the sec. And then what if Oregon, your, your boys jump mm -hmm. to the big 10 or something like what right. is the big 12 going to look like in 2034? Like that is scary to me. When you say the group of five ceasing to exist, do you think it's going to become a relegation situation? where we are going to have a grouping of teams that we don't associate with the Big Ten and SEC in the way that we kind of do now? I just meant it from a uh, just verbal standpoint. Okay. Just like we're not – like the group of five is not going to be a thing anymore, but the way that we view group of five teams is fun to watch, high-quality football in some of the places, but a lower level than the Power Five. And I think that if – the Big Ten and the SEC expand one more time and you get a few more of those bigger brands, like if we're talking about Clemson or Florida State or Miami or Oregon or Washington, mm -hmm. like those are the five big ones, right? I'm not right. forgetting anyone. If those five join those two, then without question, the remainder of the teams that are left out of that stamp of the of those two teams are going to be viewed as the, the same Lesser. way that we view the group of five now right what that looks like whether it's a different level or whether they're even playing like i don't know if like in 20 years we're just going to have a big 10 sec mega conferences where they only play each other and it's the afc and the nfc um my hope is and like you know me i'm anti uh, playoff expansion did you know that i do know that but yeah. the one thing that i am happy about is that by expanding the playoff, we are continuing to allow teams in these conferences a seat at the table, which keeps the entire country engaged. Because the thing that I don't love about the the expansion of all this, I, I actually hate the expansion. Mm -hmm. I don't like all the change. Same. Is that this is a national sport where geography used to matter and where you're from and where you went to school used to matter. Mm -hmm. And like now we're cutting off. 75 percent of the country mm -hmm. because the television deals are better and like if you're a college football fan that stinks um yeah. and i feel bad for the west coast i'm sure you probably agree with that yeah of um, course and i feel bad for i don't know teams that are like tcu deserves to be recognized more than indiana does so just being in the wrong place at the wrong time mm -hmm. also stinks i agree because it's just random. Like, I feel like it's just, like, random. Like, Rutgers was random enough to be asked to join the Big Ten, and now they get to be at the party despite the fact that they've had no buy-in to the program that's allowed them to be worthy of that seat. Mm -hmm. I think the whole thing is just one big misfire that we might end up regretting in five years. And it keeps being stacked upon, right? That we mm -hmm. just – we're adding teams to the playoff. We're adding teams to conferences. We're, we're increasing everything for what's probably just going to be a short to medium-term – explosion while everything else kind of craters around the sport. Yeah. It's like Utah doesn't get to be a part of this. Right. Yeah. You it know? doesn't reward. I mean, think about all the, yeah. It doesn't re like a big 10 or big 12 or sec or, you know, conglomeration of conferences is objectively better if Utah's involved and yet they're not in that discussion. So my hope, and I had a dream about this. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why I did. I yeah. should be dreaming about other things. But my hope would be to get like West Virginia and Baylor and TCU and Clemson and Florida State and Oregon and Washington to build a third super conference. Okay. So that everybody's included. So that the bottom half of the third super conference would have some of the Power Five teams that are being left out right now, like canceling out the Indianas and the Vanderbilt. So that though I don't I don't want 
Clemson and Florida State and Miami and Washington and Oregon to join those two conferences. Right. I want the remaining brands, Notre Dame even. But to that join just sort of steers conf- into the same idea, though, because then you're just constructing a conference with a bunch of teams that have no shared history, that there's no scar tissue, and you're oh, just. Oh, no, but it would be the only way that you could save them from being left behind completely. I just think they're going to be like, swallowed I'm, up. I just, I feel like I'm, af- I'm afraid that. We're going to get to a day where a Baylor fan doesn't see the point of watching his favorite team play anymore because they are no longer involved in the system. And Baylor is a hell of a place with a lot of fans, and they have a really good football team that can beat the hell out of a lot of the teams that are already at the table right now. But I think, to your previous point, I think a Baylor fan is always going to tune in to watch them beat the hell out of TCU. That I think think we conflate fandom with the playoff and playoff hopes – probably too much when for the entire history of the sport it's always been about beating your rivals and winning as many games in your conference as possible and only the last few years has yeah. the attention for three percent of the schools eight percent of the schools turned to how do we make the playoff and how do we win 13 games or whatever well it's like funny because that example of Baylor and TCU which goes back to the rivalry question mm-hmm. are like two teams that have legitimately competed for the national championship sure in the last 10 years, multiple times and in multiple seasons. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. But if I were a Baylor fan and somebody said, you're no longer in the system or you're no longer a part of the the seating arrangement mm-hmm. that leads into or funnels into that, right? that would be awful. I would still I, watch my team play TCU. Sure. I also would be completely and utterly devastated by the fact that my team wasn't worthy because of happenstance to be involved in that system at all, especially considering the fact they've already proven Mm -hmm. multiple times to be worthy of that distinction. I think it depends on the schedule. It depends on who Baylor would be playing, that if you have the opportunity to still watch Baylor play Oklahoma State and Iowa State and Texas Tech and TCU and all those things, and then you get to get together with friends and you tailgate or you have watch parties, I think there's still something culturally relevant. It will. I think it will bum people out, but I also think Baylor fans look forward to Baylor football all year long. And well, the good news is that there's always going to be a football game. Right. So, yeah, I don't know. Um, but maybe I'm just a fade. I don't know. I'm just I get nervous because I'm not one of like, listen, I moved across the country multiple times in my life. Mm-hmm. I've taken a chance on a girl. Um, I've done <laughs> things outside of the box. I don't feel like I am one that is afraid of change. Sure. But I am queasy with how much they're tinkering with our sport. Well, the problem is, and this is the discussion you can always have with the sport, the problem is I think college football is getting away from the main thing. And the main thing is that we have this exceptionally regional sport that comes together in terrific ways, be it in the non-conference, you know, September portion of the schedule or bowl time or however we find a national champion. But at its heart, it's this great, sport with a number of fiefdoms around the country and you built up all and this is the term we use on the show scar tissue that like if you ask an Oregon fan about the history of Oregon playing Washington State or Arizona they'll start groaning about everything that went wrong or beaming about all of the great moments and so then if you make it all if you take that away um, and you get it within the SEC and the Big Ten still but if you take that away from the ACC, and the ACC has had a number of changes, of course, but if all of a sudden, you know, Miami and Virginia aren't playing, or Florida State and Virginia Tech, or all those things, and those are still pretty recent additions to that specific conference, I think, in the grand scheme of things, then you lose a lot of what I think is is the main part of the the double helix, the DNA of college you know, football I was fandom. Listening to this awesome podcast called The Solid Verbal a few sure. months ago. I don't know, a few weeks ago. I was in L.A., your, your stomping grounds. Okay. And there was a question, I think it was a mailbag episode or something, mm-hmm. and somebody asked if you could hit pause at any time during expansion and yeah. just keep it that way. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that question? I do. And I liked both of your answers, but I, I don't know what year it would be, but you want to know when I would pause it? When? When it stopped becoming, when geography stopped becoming important to where you're located, like to your conference. Sure. And I don't know what year that was. I don't know when you would, when when you maybe and maybe it's as recent as 2020. But I, uh, I love that the Big Ten is the Midwest. Sure. I love that the SEC is the South. I love that the Big Twelve is Texas and in the middle of the country there. And I love that the Pac-12 is West Coast. And I love that there is a sense of underlying pride that if your team stinks, 
that at least the team on the West Coast that goes off to do well is representing you and where you're from and right. who you are. Um, and that, to me, is the biggest shame of all of it. And, you know, I'm very hyper-focused on the national champion. Yeah. And I always have been very, you know, stars matter, playoff-focused. Mm-hmm. You know, expansion is for cowards, the five or four best teams <laughs> that get in. Like I, I mean, I think that the expansion of the playoff is to – and I, I, it's kind of a political buzzword, but I think it's participation trophy ish, right? To me, um, that to me, these are all opinions that I have. Well, this but is I also, think but isn't very, this also just part of getting older? That you want everything to be the way it was when you specifically yeah. experienced it. Um, I guess, that, that, and that might be true because that's how I am with movies and music. Yeah, they don't make good movies anymore, and all my <laughs> my hip hop music that I used to love listening to doesn't get make, made. You don't anymore, like triplet? You don't like sad. triplet hip hop? Okay. Um, what's that? What kind of hip hop? Isn't it triplet? Isn't that's the like the the rhyming scheme or the lyrical scheme? I think they have uh, catchy songs that come out from time to time, but I yeah. think that the the category that I loved doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, and that's just like my dad. Yeah. Oh, like, it's like, it's the same the, for the everybody. The music that we used to listen to are the oldies now, which is sad. Of course. Yeah. Um, but also too. But the college football you like is now the oldies. The way no, the sport was built. Was 2014 the oldies? I love the 14 playoff. I think it's the best thing that's ever happened to the sport. And I know that people hate it because it, it has emphasized the national champion more and, and devalued the bowl system. And, like, I just never really cared about the bowls because I always viewed them as exhibitions even when – before this happened. Sure. So like when, when they, when they created a system where there is something to talk about every Tuesday night. But that's, the, the that's the hyper-focus on the national championship. Which... Yeah. But like there's that, it's like that thing's a big deal. And then you finally get the games that you otherwise can only get once a year. Right. Um, twice as much or the conference championships that lead into that. Like, I think that the culmination of that is beautiful. Um, and I like the fact that, the Pac-12, when they made it with Washington, you had a team that was stumping for the West Coast. I like when the SEC sure. makes it, you have a team for the South in the Big Ten, the Midwest, and the East. And, like, that is gone. And that that wasn't the childhood that I grew up with. I grew up with Rose Bowl was the king. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, Rose Bowl was the, was the ultimate, you know, battle uh, reward. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know if that's what I'm experiencing. I just think that... There has been more change in college football in the last three years than in the previous fifty combined. It's like, when are we? When's enough enough? Well, I think for so, like, like you know, I, I'm trying to figure out if it's a feature or a bug. How difficult it is to explain to people how the sport works, and you can do this for any sport. And I've talked about this on the show before. That like, is it cool that college football is difficult to understand? And you can say the same thing about Major League Baseball, about the NBA, about you know, the, the transfer rules in the, the premier league or F1, you can say that that's just, there's, there's very specific elements that are not obvious on its face, on their faces, whatever, that I still think maybe it's just because this is the sport I cover. I think the barrier to, uh, intellectual entry for college football is so high that you have to understand how recruiting works. You have to understand how transfers work. You have to understand how collectives work. You have to understand how bowls in the postseason works. You have to understand that a 12-team playoff... Well, to be a very dedicated fan, you do. Well, you, ha- you just there's a, a large fa- portion of fans who just like showing up on Saturday in the fall and be totally. like, what do we have out there? If yeah. you want to understand college football, it takes a lot to understand yeah. the calendar, to understand recruiting, to understand all of these things, why coaches move around like they do, why, why players move around like they do, you know, how the TV element influences everything that there is. And maybe it's because players change every year and you watch an NBA game and it's just guys are around for a long time. You watch a baseball, you know, Adam Wainwright is still pitching for, I think, the Cardinals. He's 43 years old or something. He's been he's been a major league baseball you know player for 20 you know years. How? I know your point's true. How? Because my my wife, uh, so, you know, loving person. You know, yeah, love and so you much. try to talk to her about the sport. And she, she, she asks, asks like you're speaking Portuguese. She asks about college football yeah. to show interest in my work. Of she course. She doesn't care. She has no appetite whatsoever for college football. But she'll be like, you know, what story are you working on? Tell me about your day to day. Yeah. It is impossible. Mm-hmm. Like, she's in commercial real estate. She can explain stuff to me. Like, I feel like it's easier for her to explain commercial real estate to me than it is to explain to her why I'm talking to a 10-year-old's father on the phone at Tuesday at 11 p.m. Mm-hmm. Or why I'm 
on a conference call because of a television show that's on Tuesday when the games are on Saturday. Like, there is so much that is just, like, she doesn't understand how the playoff committee works, and she tries hard to, yeah, you know, and she'll ask, like, questions like, well, didn't they beat them? Yeah. And I'll be like, yes. And then you have to explain that, you know, it's hard, you know, and you're right. And it's trying to explain it to a person that wants to get it but has no background in it is impossible. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's always been the struggle with the sport, I'm sure. Um, but at least before, it was like you win your conference, you end up in this game, right? That the, this yeah. game invites this champion and invites this champion. And, you know, every other year, you know, like they go back and forth. Who's hosting this home game in a rivalry? Whatever. Um, and now it's just like, wait, so Georgia and Texas A&M, have they ever played each other in the same conference? Have they played once? In like 11 years, something like that. And it's like, how does that scheduling work? Well, it's pretty random. <laughs> like, what? Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Uh, it's so there's just, I I guess that that can be considered, um, I always forget the name of the, the, the term, um, but, you know, that you're concern trolling or something like that, like trying to stir up an argument for the sake of an argument. But like, um, I, I don't feel like, I ever fully understand the sport because it just changes every week. And just like when I asked you about Tennessee, like can Tennessee win a playoff game in the next three years? Yeah, we're still in four team you're playoff in 14 playoff mode. When it's, yeah, right, right. And, and you have to switch that in in the snap of a finger next year, and, and then and no one's gonna even know how it goes. You're going to think about a North Carolina cornerback who you're like, oh man, that kid was a five star kid. And then you're gonna, you know, before the first North Carolina game, look at a depth chart and be like, oh, I think that dude plays for. What's, what's his name? It was a five-star North Carolina quarterback. I think he went to A&M now. You're like, oh, right. He's at A&M. And he, he left for A&M seven months ago. Because it also takes, like, I do this for you know, both of us, you know, mm-hmm. 40 hours a week, right? More than that. I can't keep up with everything. Yeah. And they do this impossible. professionally. Yeah. It's like, like I did a story last week, a, a recruiting bill, a big board, where I put the 10 most interesting uncommitted, uncommitted prospects in this cycle out mm-hmm. there. And I like wrote 200 words about every one of them. Mm -hmm. And then we published it the next day and there were like four errors in it because so much stuff happened in the 12 hour period Mm -hmm. since I, I finished it to when it went up. And it's like, I can't keep up on when this kid cancels what visit Mm -hmm. or, you know, who's going where, or, Oh, he's not going to USC anymore. Now he likes Michigan. Like it's, it's hard. Mm -hmm. Um, And like, I don't know, like, and that's another reason why it's so perfectly regional because even, now like just being a big 10 fan Mm -hmm. you have to be in the la time zone now yeah you know like what about all the los alamitos kids and how does it impact your your conference and Mm -hmm. your team and your rival like it is impossible um and it's like if you gave me a quiz right now of what team is this person on Mm -hmm. i don't know if i'd be able to pass it sometimes yeah same that's all i do this is all I do. So what do you do, Dan? Do you like study? Like you're studying for an exam going into a year? Like do you like read an Athlon or a Phil Steele and try to like memorize stuff? Athlon is right next to my toilet, <coughs> about 12 feet from here. So that gets okay. a good amount of use. Um, I go to the same two or three websites every morning just to make sure I haven't missed anything. I'll look at I'll look at the Athletic. I'll look Let's at Let's go. I'll look at the Athletic <laughs> just because just, I was, I was it's just a pretty you. thorough site. Um, I will look at, uh, the Reddit subreddit, uh, the college football subreddit. Um, I will look at ESPN for headlines, like before shows and stuff too. I'll go to ESPN and CBS as well to just look at what, if there's anything newsy that we need to discuss before the show starts that had somehow escaped my brain. But yeah, it's an ongoing process of, um, you know, sometimes I'll just be showering and be like, is he still playing for NC State? And then I'll just go to our lads or whatever, one of the depth chart sites, or, you know, I'll just yeah. Google somebody's name. Like it's we like were Devin doing. Devin Leary does not play for NC State anymore. And like, that's a big one. Yeah. It's Brennan Armstrong now, I think. It's just like this rotating I didn't know cast. That. Yeah. Brennan Armstrong, <laughs> previously yeah. of Virginia, okay. is at NC okay. State. Um, followed yeah. his old coordinator, I want to say. And like, that's not. Robert Anay. And that's like not an insignificant thing to. To no, like not no. Robert like, Anay yeah. is the current offensive coordinator at NC State. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anay Anay. Yeah. Um, and so it's one of those things where I'll just think about something randomly. Like we did a show where I just casually mentioned Parker Washington coming back for Penn State. And I was like, 
nope, I got to edit that nope. out. He's not there anymore. I was like, wasn't he yeah. just a sophomore? Redshirt sophomore. So he went to the NFL. I forgot yeah. that. Yeah. Just well, one of those you, things. You know, I once July hits, and we're like five days out, mm-hmm. I go into like study mode. Yeah. Where I, I do my best. Like I, But I even the magazines know. are terrible because they're out of date with transfers. That's right. Yeah. But I go, I Yeah. And we used to do state of the program at the athletic every year. We're not doing that this year, which was a nice tool, but a lot it of them was. are out of date. I use that. Um, yeah. For our yeah. preview shows. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's hard. Um, and maybe the video game will help that when, when the video game comes out, I used to, learn, <laughs> I hope so. Like if you, if they have the automatic uh, updated rosters of somebody transfers and you play the game a lot and you're mm-hmm. playing, you know, it's a good way to memorize. Oh, okay. Well I'm playing Virginia tech this week. Well, that running back's really good. What's his name. And then you like, you remember, you know, you know, just based on your entertainment. But I also went the video game. Like I used to play it 10 hours a week. And like, I like think in my head that I'm going to. Right. And like, there's probably a pretty, like now that my life is much different than it used to be, mm-hmm. uh, likelihood that I'm not going to play it that much at all. Right. Um, I've had PS five for two years. It has not been plugged in for two years. Yeah. That makes sense. That's, that's fatherhood. I don't know. For some yeah. people, I guess. Um, I, I hope I can play that. that. I love that game. I do too. Um, yeah, it's it's just one of those things. But you are just going to have to use Google.com. And look, if this is a professional problem that Ari and I have, that's a great professional problem, right? We haven't thrown out yeah. our back doing manual labor and working 18 hours a day under the but sun. But do your research. Yeah, you just got to do your research. You're, and it, You're it's not all, the only one that, that gets that complaint, though. And it's like, that's all we do is research. It's all we do. <laughs> it's all we do. And then people comment, and do your research. Yeah. And there are they're just, you know... However many Power 5 teams, however many G5 teams, 130 whatever overall. And you honestly, the, the tool that I use before doing shows is like Ty and I did a show, can these eight win programs or can these teams ascend to become consistent eight win programs and can these 10 win programs? Yeah. And as I'm looking at names and you know the guys who put up the best numbers last year and re-watching like, film of these specific guys, I have to use Google News and search their name and it says... Oh, he's very pleased with the steps he took forward in spring. I'm like, great, he's still there. He didn't transfer to a bigger place. He didn't go pro. He like, I need that Google News to confirm to me that there's like an SB Nation blog post talking about him. Like, thank God, right. somebody mentioned him in the last month to let me know he's still at that. He's school. still on the team. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's what I need because I am a dum dum, as most listeners can attest to this show. That's I mean, all. maybe it'd be a good website. Like, still there. Current, I mean, that's our lads, but our lads isn't always updated. I do not trust that place. I don't. So. I don't either. I um, look at it all the time, but I never. I don't know who does it. So it's. You scary. know what I do? I look at our lads, and then I go to Google News to confirm that those Got updates it. are true. So yeah, that's that's. I mean, again, cry me a river that this is the job. And these are the struggles that I have as a job, but it is tough. As again, I mean, recruiting and your wife, like to explain to her what edits are, like oh, he committed to yeah. Texas, I'm like. Maybe. <laughs> Who My knows? My wife will be like, why does anybody care what this 17-year-old kid's doing? Yeah. I was like, if you understood. Yeah. She goes, wait a minute. You're flying across the country to go watch 15-year-olds throw footballs? Yep. That's yeah. what I'm doing. That helps that it's in Redondo Beach. Um, yeah. Ari Wasserman. I don't even know if we have time for Dunzo. I mean, we've already done this in hour 10. We'll do save it for another time. Um, I don't know. It's I, up to you. These I, are the- I, I'll stay with you longer, It's your, but it's your, your deal. Uh, so well, how we long can- do your episodes ever go at the longest? I don't know. Like an hour 20 in the off season, maybe. Right okay. now we're at an hour 10. We can go through these quickly. So it's just Dunzo. Dunzo! <laughs> or not Dunzo, right? <laughs> I know, it's shocking. Kristen Cavallari yeah, in your ears. Yeah. Um, North Carolina, Dunzo or not Dunzo? I only say uh, this because you were very early on the Wisconsin Dunzo train. I maybe was against when they got destroyed by Notre Dame a couple years ago. Yeah, and everyone got mad at me. You know? Everybody got mad at you. And I remember anytime you question Paul Christ in Wisconsin, people were like, why don't we just calm down? It always works out. And then it didn't. Um, yeah. I, I uh, North Carolina. Oh, man. Dunzo. Dunzo. I think you're right. I think you're right. Which is sad. It's sad because I also think receipt, hot take, Dunzo, you know, collab mm-hmm. here. And I'm going to duck under the camera so no one sees me when I say this, I think. <laughs> but like, and I might, I'm probably really wrong. Dan, I'm I'm even embarrassed to say it, to yeah. you, but you're my buddy, and I'm going to do it yeah, for your, your soundbite. I may draft Drake May before Caleb Williams if I'm an NFL GM. I don't think that's a crazy take. 
I don't know. Caleb Williams. I think is a at the top, he does everything. I think at the top, I it's love just Drake May. Personal preference. Well, I know, but how could somebody not just like open their eyes and watch Caleb play football and be like, "That's the guy." Like I, I know that that sounds crazy, right? But I think that Drake May is the perfect combo. I, I don't know size, athleticism, ability to run, arm, poise, all that stuff. I guess maybe you take Caleb Williams on all those over him, but I just there's something about him that makes me think that guy is going to be a ten time Pro Bowler. I mean, the only case against Caleb Williams is not a case against him specifically. It's he had nope. better receivers. He had, uh, I mean, it was his second year starting, and it was Drake May's first season starting as a full time yeah. quarterback. And so Drake May clearly last year was ahead of where Caleb Williams was as a freshman two years ago. Right. Right. Caleb Williams as a freshman. Um, so the progression, but, you could see the ceiling being unknown for Drake May, whereas we're getting closer to knowing what the college ceiling is to Caleb Williams. Like I saw there was like a it was like nine to one that Drake May would be the first pick in next year's draft. And like part of me just wants to like hammer that. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, he was throwing to a Bolitnikoff Award winner, and all due respect to who was it last year? Josh Downs, um, yeah. who was very good. Who was like a third or fourth round pick, by the way. Right. So yeah. throwing to Mario Williams, throwing to having a good line in front of him. Uh, both teams had garbage defenses, so they were asked to basically shoulder a ton of the, the workload to, to get to the win column. But I don't think it's a crazy take, but I think the, the ceiling of Caleb Williams, because yeah. of his Im- improvisational ability and his ability with his feet, that he's, he's closer to being a complete a quarterback. Lower. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I think that I made that point just to make the point that I really believe, which is North Carolina is must watch television this fall. Yeah, of course. Yeah. We talked yeah. about that. Yeah. The yeah. only thing standing in the way of North Carolina is North Carolina. Um, yeah. all right. Next quote, next Dunzo or not Dunzo. Dunzo. Uh, Miami hurricanes. You can be very not early Dunzo. on, not Dunzo. Very early on. That's but you're probably more qualified than I am on this one. Mm. I don't know. I think while it's trading below 30 cents a share now, I think. I, I have no idea what uh, you know what the missing link is with Mario. You've watched it every Saturday for years. Yeah, but I don't think that their team or their roster is nearly where it's going to be in year four. So if they're in year four and they're still weirdly bad, right? Then I'll be worried. But like, I think it'd be way too soon to give up on Miami. It's one of those things where I think he thinks he can work Miami into wins, that that they can run stairs into wins. Like, I think Mario Cristobal would eat fried eggs with a hammer kind of thing. Like, I think he, he thinks he can just mash it, you know, whether it's the, the vision on offense, whether it's the recruiting, which he's always going to be able to recruit. I think that's the problem with Miami, that I don't think like there's... His recruiting ability and their NIL collective makes it impossible to give up on them in year two. Okay. I didn't think they had a four win seal or four or five win floor. I just didn't see that coming. So yeah, that's new. Um, next Dunzo, not Dunzo. Dunzo. Oklahoma state, a traditional winner, not on the highest level, but a traditional winner, nine, 10 wins. It felt like was almost automatic for the pokes and they collapsed last year amid quarterback injury amid the defense falling off a cliff with Derek Mason uh, you know, it's funny about Oklahoma State is I yeah. covered the TCU Oklahoma game, mm-hmm. Oklahoma State game last year in Fort Worth. Yep. And I knew that I was going to write a column after the game, one way or the other, because they were both undefeated. If you remember in that game, mm-hmm. that um, Gundy is one of the most underappreciated assets in coaching in the country. Yeah. Uh, and then TCU won, and then obviously those teams went in very different directions. Yes. Um. But that column was like pre-written in my brain when I got to the stadium that day, Mm -hmm. Um, because I believe that. Like, if you go look, like you said, and they were up in that game, right? Were they up at the half? Yeah, they blew a big lead. I think. Yeah, Yeah, they were winning by, I think, twenty-one in that game, Mm -hmm. Uh, and it went to overtime. And uh, you know, I think the game ended like with a yard short of the goal. I gotta go back. You watch so many. It was. I think you forget. I think it was. uh, Came down to field goals. I want to say. Oklahoma. Yeah, there's a it, double it was overtime like a multiple game. Yeah. Overtime game. Yeah. Um, and I didn't write that. Now I'm kind of happy I did. But like, if I truly believe that Gundy is one of the more underappreciated coaching properties, okay, then I don't know because like, what does Dunzo mean? Like, they are never going to win ten games again, 
with Mike Gundy, yeah, essentially. But they're in a, an easier conference, I suppose. I would say not Dunzo then. Okay. Uh, next one, Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame. Not even close to Dunzo on them. Okay. Why is that? Uh, I love. I think Marcus Freeman gets it. I think that okay. uh, you know, and Dunzo too. It's like the thing that I love about this game is that it's very subjective to what team you're talking about mm-hmm. because like what does Dunzo mean like are they going to make the playoff or get to the final four of course I think Notre Dame's going to be good enough to get to the 12 team playoff and win two games and get to the final four they've already done it in a more difficult system okay Especially with Brian, with Brian the Kelly they're probably not, yeah they, they did get with Brian Kelly and obviously these first year coaches are or second year coaches are hard to mm-hmm. to kind of you know, you gotta. There's a leap of faith there. You know, mm-hmm. and sometimes you're you're walking the plank instead of you know taking that right leap. But I think that Notre Dame is more competitive in highly um, sought after living rooms for these recruits than they were. I don't think that Brian Kelly um, was obsessed with recruiting the way that you need to be to win a championship, which is why I was kind of down on him in LSU. Because I feel like you have to be a maniacal recruiter to win at LSU and to beat Alabama and Georgia. It turns out I might be wrong on that because he's won everywhere. Well, LSU I also won. think no, recruiting to Notre Dame is a little bit different than recruiting to LSU. It is. Well, it's also like there are certain you know academic and cultural requirements that you have to fit to, to get those guys there where LSU that doesn't exist. And I think he probably went to LSU because it's the place that can win a national championship with with, with way less um, – What's that? It's a easier path or less path re- right. uh, to resistance. Mm-hmm. Unless you think Alabama and Georgia are, are more resistance than getting a kid into a Catholic school with high academic standards. Right. Pick In poison, northern Indiana, it's more difficult to sell a kid, especially from the south or the west coast or wherever, to come to northern Indiana instead of yeah. LSU or Florida or wherever. But too, way too early to, to not think that they could at least win 10 games or 11 games, make the playoff, and get to the Final Four again especially if they're lucky enough to manage a path to that final four that doesn't consist of playing one of the super teams, which I think will probably unveil itself the way it did for TCU this year. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that gives me pause in terms of the ruthless nature, potentially ruthless nature of Marcus Freeman and Notre Dame is Tommy Reese leaves for Alabama, which is whatever. And Notre Dame, premier program, national program, recruits everywhere, has a reputation for playing in big games, whatever. They bring in a number of sitting offensive coordinators, quality offensive coordinators. They come to South Bend. They interview. And then Notre Dame hires internally. Now, it could be that Marcus mm-hmm. Freeman feels so good about, was it Gerard Parker? Jared, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Gerard Parker. That he was comparing everybody against the internal candidate that he wanted to hire from the onset. But I also worry that teams in similar situations, and I know Georgia hired internally in a former guy in Mike Bobo, um, generally find the best possible guy, and it's a, a wide national net if you're a national program. We need to bring in, you know, it's Alabama has, you know, Kiffin and Sark as analysts. And the schools that Notre Dame compares itself against, you know, sort of throw that that wide net and ohio state hired internally as well this year but you know initially at the They've onset been hiring internally for years and i think you make a case as part of the reason why they don't win that could be later. right brian hartline's yeah. never fully called an offense so um and i guess probably isn't fully calling an offense this fall but yeah i i, I don't think that's the case but even with the quarterback coach you know there there have been a lot of internal hires and, right. and reorganizations on that staff yeah so that's that's the thing that gives me a little bit of pause that they interviewed bigger national coordinators uh, and went internal. That there may have been trepidation from those candidates. So like, I don't know if this. But when is you say guy. Dunzo, yeah, it's pretty pretty. You want to talk about Re? You know, <laughs> I'm asking the question. Take. I don't know. I don't. <laughs> yeah, no. I, I I mean, I I know that I'm hyperbolic and I like yeah. jump to step nine from step one all the time. Yeah. But you think I'm going to have the gall to come on the solid verbal with Ty not here and tell him that his <laughs> squad is done so? What do you think? I'm I'm socially illiterate? What What is the um, recruiting ocean, as you like to say, between Marshall and Notre Dame? Yeah. Well, no, listen. Listen. <laughs> or even Cal and Notre Dame, because Cal was right there. Yeah. And the thing recent that is so Stanford. hard for me. Yeah. Right? Like, is that upsets happen. I know, of course. Okay? They happen all the time. 
but they usually happen when a team has their heads up their ass. Can I say that on the solo? You approval? may, of course. Or they're they're walking through the September schedule, looking around, not taking an opponent seriously, or they're playing like, you know, those games where you can tell in the first quarter this team just doesn't have it today. Sure. You know, they rarely happen in rivalry games and playoff games because teams go into those games they're locked with, in, knowing what's at stake, yeah. locked in, ready to play their best football and motivated properly. Mm-hmm. Um. So comparing the recruiting ocean of Michigan and Ohio State is so much different than recruiting oceans between any of the other upsets that happen. Like it, they don't they don't happen usually that way. I, I understand. Hope that is, but I, I I am I think at some point in this off season I'm going to look up the entire blue chip ratio between those two schools and like actually like add up how many top 100 players does this one have in this and how many top 200 players and then I think it'll be more mathematically uh, reasonable to, I think you'll think what I think. I think I could change your mind. I I think your point is a good one. I just watched that game and the manner in which they lost to Marshall. Oh yeah. I, I mean, do you think it distracted Ohio state loses to Marshall? No, but Notre Dame Dunzo or being Dunzo or not Dunzo doesn't mean that they're living to that standard either. Like I, that's we're we're doing it to, against Notre Dame's own. I'm standard, just no. I'm presenting a data point um, mm-hmm. that is a little bit. Well, troubling. do you think that Notre Dame will recruit better in, in year four of the Marcus Freeman era than they did during the best year or cycle of the Brian Kelly era? Maybe I don't I don't have the rankings in front of me. I don't know what the, the height do. of Brian Kelly was. I do. Um, I think that in year four, if they're not recruiting infinitely better than Brian Kelly, then he's not the right coach. Okay. Um, but I am not going to, I'm still going to suspend judgment on what he did last year in the same way that we were talking about the, uh, Florida build earlier, which is, you know, Billy Napier. That was another podcast. I'm sorry, but Billy Napier can go six and six. Mm-hmm. Um, but if he signs a class of 10 top 100 players in it, then that is more valuable to Billy Napier than what happens on the field. Early I on. I think we're in that currently where we are. That might not be true a year from now. Right. But it's true now. I still think that we are in that era for Notre Dame. I like the aggression now, six getting six, Sam Hartman. I like that aggression. Yeah. That's a good sign. They go, they go six and six again and lose to a, a weird team again. And they sign another class that's kind of, you know, loses its five-star talent the way that Notre Dame's class did a year ago. Mm -hmm. I might be more willing to say Dunzo or ring the alarm bells a year from now. But I think that I want to be, for as reactionary of a human being as I am, Mm -hmm. I like to pride myself on not being so reactionary when I pull the firing Dunzo ripcord on coaches. To be clear, that's not what the word reactionary means. What do you mean? (laughs) The word reactionary means you want to go back to a more conservative time in history. I just mean that, like I, I know what you mean. Something happens. <laughs> yeah, I know. What is the, what is the, well? What's the proper word for that then? Um, I emotional, impulsive, impulsive. Emotional? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, maybe I'm more impulsive. You know, by the way, I couldn't pass a high school English test, <laughs> and I'm a sports writer for a living. Um, I just remember finding that out randomly. And then noticing people using it in a different way. And I was like, that's not what reactionary Well, I've never heard you say anyone ever, a person opposing political, yeah. reactionary of a person or set of views opposing political or social liberalization or reform. Yeah. Wow. That's not what that word means. No. <laughs> I just came across it randomly. This is not me saying I have a huge vocabulary, oh, I which were, I don't. I thought you were being a vocab snob. No, but, yeah, I don't no, have a huge uh, vocab, but I just, at some point reading something said somebody wants to somebody is acting as like the most reactionary candidate of the group or something like that i was like what is okay and i looked it up and there it was okay yeah that's good to know maybe i'll stop saying that maybe i won't because i think the entire point of communication is just you know what i meant right yeah well sometimes words you know sometimes people use words incorrectly so often that merriam webster's just like fine whatever that's what it means yeah go ahead i give in it's like Chuck Culpepper is one of the greatest writers I've ever read in my entire life. He doesn't use the right words all the time on purpose. No. And it's art. The other one, I always forget this, nonplussed, used to forever mean something completely different than people use nonplussed. They're like, yeah, I'm not impressed. I'm nonplussed. It's, it's being surprised and not knowing how to react is nonplussed. It's not being unimpressed. I don't think I've ever used that word in my entire life okay. in any context. That was the other um, one I had. But yes, continue. Sorry. What was I saying, though? Oh, but with coaching, with not being reactionary to coaches. Right. (laughs) Because I do think that 
if you pull the cord too quickly, you might have the wrong. Like it takes time. I totally agree. It, it takes. It takes like Dabo Sweeney. If he were hired in 2019 and had the same first four seasons that he had at Clemson, would might have been fired. Mm-hmm. Sure. <laughs> Think about that. And then he's the only coach that turned a, a good team into a monster in the entire modern era of college football. No one's even come close to doing what he's done, and he would have been fired. So it's like part of me hates these 10-year all-guaranteed contracts. Right. But I also love them because it forces patience. I agree. Um and I like, just so want you. Like, I just want to give you an opportunity to be early, right? That I can in three no, years no, roll tape. One. And if it's not in this case, it's not in this case. Also, the Paul Christ one was early, be- based on what everybody else did, but it was late in his tenure. It was late in his tenure. Yeah, yeah. He had I don't, shown. I don't have, I mean, you, you'll have to. You'd have a hard time finding me being like, get this guy out of here in year one or two. Right. Like that. That doesn't. But when Dan Mullen gets on to the microphone and says comments about recruiting not mattering focal until point right December. now, right now. Yeah. get that guy out of here yeah, yeah like i can i can i can totally tell when it's the time <laughs> you know um but the year two on a you know everybody was so high on him too it's like dunzo yeah. no not for me I, I always just offer you the the platform and opportunity yeah. the last one is the pac-12 dunzo yeah okay dunzo it's a shame it's an easy case to make. Uh, I want to know what you think. Is it Dunzo? Likely. Yeah. I that think. Doesn't mean Oregon's Dunzo or Washington is. I just no. Means they'll. The they'll. Is. I. I assume make their way to the Big Ten at some point, um, and they'll figure out ways to uh, to convince all the presidents and figure out some sort of deal, whether it's you know next year or twenty twenty eight, whatever it is. Um, I just you're gonna you're gonna ask people to tune into a conference without LA schools and then adding San Diego state, maybe SMU or something like that. I just think it's going to be picked apart and I don't know what the big 12 yeah. is going to do with regard to Colorado or Arizona, whatever. I, th- uh, I know there's, there's certain things that tie those two together, but if they could have kept one LA school, maybe. Yeah. And originally I, you know, you hear all sorts of stories about who was going to go and who wasn't going to go and how things change. Um, and I don't think UCLA was in that initially. Um, and that, you know, there was maybe Notre Dame being involved in certain conversations. Um, but that's a really tough thing to do when the uh, the center of the West Coast is not involved with the West Coast football conference. So, Dan. Yeah. Reactive. Reactive. The There's the word. Aaron. Oh, uh, Aaron in the comments. Yes. In, in Reactive. The comments. There you go. You know, it's funny, Aaron, because... From now on, like as I do podcasts into the future, mm-hmm. I'll never make that mistake again, and I'll say it correctly now, and it'll be because of you. And you can pass it forward next time you're at one of your fancy yeah, dinner I'm not parties. Yeah, do it when there's a people listening to make them sound like an asshole. I'll right. just do it in private after. <laughs> but yeah, I'll do it. I'll, I'll help them out uh, when we're not live on a podcast. Well, see, I'm doing it to help the people listening. Also, yeah, yeah, you're if, always the good guy. I'm just trying to spin it that way. Um, I don't know. I think that's yeah. a good show. I think we did a good show together. Um, and it's a shame because I wanted to hear the life topics. I'll but give you one I, life question. Okay. One quick one, and then I, I have to go right. It's a two-parter. Okay. Uh, the first question, with regard to parenting, what do you mm-hmm. and your wife argue about the most? Okay. And two-parter, who's usually who usually comes out on top? I've never won an argument with my wife about anything ever. Okay. Okay. First uh, part of the question, where where is your biggest difference in philosophy? Everybody always says that you uh, really find out where you are in your relationship when you have a kid. Of course. Because it's very strenuous, right? Mm-hmm. And like you have disagreements and stuff. Um, her and I must be really in love or have an easy kid. Okay. But we don't really fight all that much as it pertains to the child. How old is she? Child. She's two. That said, mm-hmm. I know that we are also coming up on an age, now that she's almost two. Going to test you. Where there's going to be more social discussions about where is she eating or mm-hmm. disciplinary. If she throws a fit, how do you react to of this? Course. And I feel like those are the types of things where we might disagree on more because now it's autopilot. Oh, she pooped her pants. Change it. We need to change her, whatever. Like all that stuff I think is just kind of like rudimentary, you know, you know, uh, 
cause and effect type stuff. Mm -hmm. So we haven't had that. The one thing that I, if I could change about her Mm -hmm. parenting style is that anytime anything goes even remotely off course, Mm -hmm. as it pertains to her health or her schedule or her diet or her pooping schedule, my wife gets very emotional, Mm. like nervous. So she has a mosquito bite on her leg and there's a huge red circle around it. It looks kind of odd. She is increasingly nervous. Off, I'm sure off to the Mayo Friday Clinic in Minneapolis. Days. Yeah. We are taking her to doctor appointments at times when I don't believe that's necessary. Fair. That said, mm-hmm. I love that about her because she is such an engaged and Loved loving it. mother and only cares that her child is okay. Yeah. So I would never get into a fight with her about well, it. Well, once you um, have kids three and four, that won't be a... Yeah, and like I understand too. It's like you don't you get one shot at this. Yeah. So like you don't want to like I'd rather take her to a doctor's appointment and be like, What are you doing here, Jackass? than not take her and like wish we did. Yeah. So she's always right on that regard. But I do think that there are times where she gets more emotional about something when um it doesn't call for it. Mm -hmm. But then I'm sure she would say I'm too lax all the time when I need to be more uh reactive to the you know. Good use of reactive. Situation. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. But uh, so far, no marital problems as a result of the kid. That's great. That's yeah. always a win. I don't have a great answer for this. I think my wife is probably a little bit too permissive where I'm a little bit more of a hard ass. But I've got a four-year-old and a two-year-old, both boys, who are just like yeah. monsters. Um, like the, the We are at a point right now, Dan, mm-hmm. where our daughter has bit people in class. Yeah. Okay. And... It's been because she has all these words she wants to use, but she can't talk it, and she gets frustrated. Yeah. Okay. And then right after she bites somebody, she's like cries because she's guilty about it. Mm-hmm. She knows what I just did caused this person pain, even though she's not like biting really, really hard. Yeah. It's just like a nip. But we have to sign forms at daycare because they keep track of all this stuff. Uh huh. Like Britt was very concerned about it, and I am not concerned about it because everybody that teaches there says this is a phase that happens all the time Mm -hmm. once she starts talking she'll be able to express her emotions and this will stop Mm -hmm. who's wrong like should i be more concerned about this should we be doing something like parenting style wise because all we can do is say we don't bite we kiss we don't bite we like you know all the things she'll be fine but should i be like calling people like hey we need to like make sure this isn't an issue no you can google it and look for tips about how to speak to a two-year-old about biting not the first biter in that class probably not the Five thousand. Yeah, uh, and she's not like breaking skin or anything. It's just like you know, yeah. love taps, very brief. Uh, but we also don't want a kid who's going to bite other kids. So I, I think it's a total. Like that's base. an example. Yeah, yeah. I've got a two-year-old who can't keep his hands off of his wiener. Okay. Uh, yeah. Be careful how you react to that. Um, and he will. He will. <laughs> all day long. We say pockets, pockets, dude. Um, <laughs> and it's been weeks of it. Um, and he eventually will. Not worried. Yeah, yeah. It's not super great when it happens at the library and down come the shorts. That's not great. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you roll with it. It's just the journey, man. It's the journey. It's the journey. All right. On yeah. that note. Right. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. If you have listened this far, we always appreciate that. And uh, Ari Wasserman, The Athletic. You can find him on fields at various parts of the country. Um casinos at various parts of the country gyms yes. at various parts of the country yes he is now a card carrying member of the swole patrol so ari wasserman thank you very much for your time as always anywhere else people can find you the athletic and when our podcast feed returns i'll let you know and then you can give me a plug in a month i assume it's not going to be called the andy staples show anymore or are you going to leave Who's it andy there staples? just for posterity I, I think that we – I thought it would be funny, and I told Andy this myself when we <laughs> left, that we should keep it there. You could do and it. I thought the show could be the Andy List Staples show. It could be the Andy List Staples show. It could be the Andy Staples show featuring Ari Wasserman and Nicole Auerbach and Max Olsen, whatever. Just have a super long title. Or it could just be called Not the Andy Staples Show. And that way you still get Andy's SEO while being – you remember the dumb Starbucks – Remember that? Yeah. The Nathan Felder thing? Yeah. So you just call it not the Andy Staples show. You get the Andy Staples SEO. <laughs> we, yeah. We Do we own his name? I don't know. I don't know how that works. But uh, yeah, um, we are still kind of working through what the podcast is going to look like. Yeah. 
Um, I will be a part of it in a big way. Um, we have a lot of talent at the athletic that mm-hmm. is also going to be a part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, we're rebranding and, you know, we're in our, uh, our cave, but mm-hmm. we will emerge in a few weeks and we will be ready to ride. So, uh, until then stick with the athletic. Um, yes. And you have a lot of really good, uh, college football podcast options. This is one of the best, if not the best, I'm very blessed that you had me on. I'm always appreciative of, of any airtime that you give me. My pleasure. I am a happy and loyal listener to your show, and I love you guys. Love you too. Have a great day, everybody. And uh, I don't know, make it count. Talk soon.